Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Enhancing Ortho-K Fitting with the latest technology and software. You have a text box where you can enter questions. Feel free to enter your questions at any time, and we will discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Jason Jedlicka. Dr. Jedlicka is a residency and fellowship trained optometrist, having completed a residency in cornea and specialty contact lenses and a fellowship in anterior segment disease. He is the past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society, a fellow and diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow and board member of the Contact Lens Society of America. He lectured internationally, written on contact lens and anterior segment topics, and has special interest in specialty lens design and ocular surface imaging. Welcome, Dr. Jedlicka. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to be here. Um, it's my pleasure to get to spend this time with you talking about ortho -K lens fitting, uh, specifically how um, we can use some software to enhance our fits and um, using the Oculus instrumentation that is tied in with some of these software programs. So hopefully this will be um, an introduction to some software programs you may not be familiar with that you'd have the ability to use if you want to. And um, if you already have an Oculus instrument, um, you can get started with these programs anytime. If you don't, um, this might be motivation for you to look at one of the um, Oculus instruments that you can incorporate and do um, better high-tech ortho-K lens fitting. So, um, Thinking about orthokeratology in the year 2020, obviously 2020 has so many COVID-related connotations, but um, thinking about ortho-K right now where we stand, we know that with myopia control, myopia management, whatever you want to call it, um, that ortho-K is getting um, more utilization than ever in the States and, and around the world. Um, I don't see that changing. I think even as um, we have soft multifocal options available for myopia management, um, there's still more and more patients will probably do better still with ortho-K. I still find it to be um, by far my preference for myopia management. And so again, I'm doing more ortho-K than I ever have in the year 2020. Uh, what else? COVID means less desirable to use fitting sets. We want to get away from reusing lenses and make lenses for our patients um, that are made for them. Uh, we don't have to, so we don't have to put on lenses on their eye other than ones that are brand new and made just for our patients. What else do we know? In 2020, we've got technology and that technology means better and better fits, fitting routine eyes more easily and efficiently, and fitting more complex eyes for patients who want ortho-K that maybe in the past would have been challenging fits. Can we get those patients fitted in lenses um, successfully? So um, again, we'll talk just briefly about what our goal is with ortho-K. I mean, we wanna take a cornea that looks like this, a normal shaped cornea. We wanna apply a lens that fits something like this that creates a nice bullseye pattern of minimal apical clearance centrally that nice return zone capturing the, the fluid and the dye, and then that solid ring of alignment 360. That solid ring of alignment is really the key to a successful ortho-K lens fit, and that's what um, we should be after. And ultimately, at the end, we want an outcome that looks something like this, where we've got a nice treatment, treated area flattening right over the pupil with a nice solid ring around it of um, uncorrection, actually under correction, this is going to work great for, again, our myopia management patients. You know, historically, maybe the picture in the upper left was what we were, were working with with a lot of patients. We didn't necessarily know how to prescribe a lens that would align the, the cornea 360 optimally. And so this is maybe was a decent looking fit for us five or 10 years ago. Um, but really, this is not what we should be after. This is not really an acceptable fit, and we can do much better than that now with our corneal measurements and with the lenses that we can prescribe, where we're looking for something more like the picture on the bottom right, where we get that nice solid ring of alignment all the way around. The picture in the upper left, you can see we don't have alignment over most of the lower half of that lens, and we can do better than that. 
So the modern contact lens practice, we've got great instruments for us to help us to prescribe better lenses and to manage our contact lens patients more efficiently and effectively. Um, and Oculus makes two of those instruments that are just amazing. One is the Pentacam tomographer and the other is the Keratograph 5M topographer. And we'll talk about how both of these instruments can be used in the OrthoK practice. Um, and we'll also again go into some software design programs. Um, the Keratograph, I mean, we could go on and have an entire webinar just on the power of the Keratograph and all the things it can do. But I did wanna just point out a couple highlights about this instrument and why I think it's a, a good instrument for a practice that wants to do OrthoK. Our main patient population for OrthoK again is probably children. And a lot of these children can be intimidated by an instrument that gets very close to their eye, that touches their eyelid, that touches their brow, et cetera. Some of our topographers do that. They get in, have to get in really close to the eye. And again, that can be difficult for kids. The Keratograph has a, a comfortable working distance where the instrument is a good distance away from the eye when we're taking our image. We also have the option of turning off the light to the rings prior to capturing our, or our topography. So we can use infrared light to see, to focus our instrument. And then just at the very moment of capture, the rings can flash on for just a split second. So again, very comfortable for patients. Um, the instrument stays a distance away. The light isn't bright or bothersome where you feel like squinting. This is a very comfortable way to take a corneal topography using Placido Disc technology. Um, just wanna kind of show you real quick how simple this is. This is a video of us taking an instrument or a topography with our keratograph. We're just gonna push in so we come into focus, we get things in focus, and then the instrument auto captures and it moves right to our topography screen. So the instrument guides you through the process of getting it in focus. And once everything is aligned and focused, it auto captures. It's very easy to use. Some of the other great features of a keratograph that we can use in OrthoK is the photography option to document our fits. I love using this. I love showing patients just how great their lenses fit when we've got a good fit, um, but also for, again, documenting what a fit looks like, especially if we're struggling with a fit for some reason, we want to be able to take a picture and give it to our lab to help um, them to troubleshoot for us. Um, you've got this option on the keratograph with the anterior segment photography. And then once we're underway with our fitting, of course, we have all the great features like the comparing exams to make sure that our, our treatment is centered, that we've got a nice ring of correction going. And we can do a refractive analysis. And one of the things I love about this map, again, is we can look at our differential map and show how much correction we've achieved. So if I have a patient who's coming in who I know that their prescription is, let's say, um, a minus four, um, I can look down into my refractive box and it will actually show me how much refractive error I have corrected with my, um, with my treatment. So I can know whether I should expect to get a good outcome visually before I even walk in and talk to the patient. So those are some great features of the Keratograph. And again, the instrument's full of great options, but those are just a few that are kind of interesting points that I thought I would point out specifically regarding orthokeratology. Um, now moving on to the Pentacam, the Pentacam of course is a different instrument. It's not Placido disc, it's not reflection based, it's a rotating shine flute camera. So it uses the slit beam and takes 25 or 50 cross-sectional images of the anterior segment of the eye, as you see in the picture on the right. And what that does is it gives us full corneal data. So with a Pentacam, we can truly get out to the entire corneal, um, entire corneal width and all meridians to capture the, the most amount of corneal data. And why is this important? Again, with Ortho K in 2020, one of the things we're doing more now is we're fitting them a little bit larger. I know that in the past, Ortho K lenses were often fit in the 10.0, 10.5 maybe 10, six millimeter diameter. Um, nowadays we're fitting them 11, 11 and a half millimeters. And if we want to get optimal fits, um, we're gonna need to get more corneal data. We wanna get uh, data out to the peripheral cornea as far out as we can um, and not have to extrapolate it, but actually measure it. It's also not tear layer dependent. 
And in some cases, again, with our ortho K patients where we've got abrupt changes in curvature after the treatment has been initiated, where the tear layer can be a little bit disrupted by those rings, uh, the Pentacam can capture an image every time. Pentacam also can detect subtle disease processes that may preclude ortho K in some patients, um, which is good to know, good to have baseline data. And um, while we're not gonna talk about that so much tonight, uh, the Pentacam also has scleral lens integration software for designing customized scleral lenses if you're also into that as part of your practice. So before we start talking about um, the software programs that we can use to actually make ortho K lenses, let's talk about our corneal topography that we want to capture. Let's remember that this, that when you obtain baseline data on your patients, if you are successful at orthokeratology, you may never have the chance to get this data again. You're always going to have a, an altered cornea going forward by the shape of that lens. And so every topography you do in the future on your patients as you monitor their progress and how they're doing annually or, or however often you're going to follow these patients, you're always going to be comparing it to your baseline measurement. So that baseline measurement has to be as good as you can get. Um, so again, I would say take multiple maps, um, make sure that you've got ideal maximal amount of corneal coverage that you can get um, and keep taking them until you get a good map. Um, we want to get good refractive data, dry and wet. Take the time to get good measurements of the patient's prescription. If you have axial length measurement capabilities, um, obviously we want to do that at this point as well. And again, get good topographies. Take the time to get the best possible image to get the best possible outcomes. Um, this is just an example of a keratograph display. And I wanted to highlight a few things, obviously in the lower left part, of the topography, you can get information about the K readings, the central K, um, the K mean, et cetera, uh, the amount of astigmatism, the eccentricity, so on and so forth. We also see um, in the center of the lower part, the corneal diameter in this patient, uh, 11.93. That's helpful information, again, as we're designing our lens, if we have a, a target diameter in mind. Um, but again, what I wanted to point out in this map is what's inside that yellow circle. Um, you see a, a value called the AA cornea total, and this gives us the amount of corneal coverage that we're getting with our map, true measurements. And again, I like that number to be above 75% for our baseline map. Again, anything less than that, we're, we're sacrificing a lot of baseline data, and uh, it's going to be difficult to get us the best possible lenses and the best comparison in the future. We also see below that a sag height differential at eight millimeters um, of 16 microns. So again, this is an important reading that's printed right on your initial display that tells you whether you should be fitting this patient in a spherical or toric uh, ortho K lens if you're fitting them for ortho K. A guideline modern ortho K prescribing is around 30 to 40 microns of sag height difference at eight millimeters. Um, we should be switching them to a toric lens if we want to get proper alignment in the periphery. And so again, this is a quick, easy way to see how difficult this patient's probably going to be to fit. In this case, it'd probably be relatively straightforward with a low sag height differential. Again, um, here's an example of a patient where we've only got 57% corneal coverage. And when we pull away the extrapolated parts, you see we don't have a lot of truly measured data. This is the type of map we're going to want to repeat to get a better outcome so that we um, have a better baseline information. Especially if we're going to use software to design our lens, we really want the most amount of true data measured in order to get the best possible lens design. So this would be an unacceptable baseline map. We want to repeat it, having the patient open wider and try to get more corneal measurement. Here's an example of a, just a poor quality map. You can see A, that our corneal coverage is below 50%, and B, that a lot of the data looks choppy and irregular. This is just not a good map. And again, this is not something we want to use as a baseline either for uh, creating a new lens with a software program or for following up as a baseline map for future reference. Sometimes, as good as our instruments are, they misinterpret the data. And here's an example of a patient where the, the dashed line, which is supposed to be outlining our pupil for us, is actually a little bit off 
target if you look at the picture on the left. Um, again, this is not the best baseline map. We'd want to verify that the markings for the corneal diameter and for the pupil are properly placed. And if they're not, then we just want to simply repeat our topography until we get a better map. Again, it's such an easy thing to repeat a keratograph. You can just do several readings and find an optimal map. So again, just to drive home this point as if we haven't already, if you're going to do a map-based software-driven lens, the lens will only be as good as the data you put into the software program. Um, garbage in, garbage out. If you get a good map, um, you're going to get a good lens. Take the time to repeat these maps until you get the best possible outcomes. So moving on to actually fitting ortho K again, there's a few different ways that we can do this. Um, we can certainly empirically order lenses and that's what a lot of people do when they don't want to invest in a lot of equipment or uh, in lenses. And this is calling the lab with information. We can sometimes use a fitting set or a diagnostic set to fit as well. Um, that has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and increasingly now software design is uh, appears to be the way of the future for getting better lenses um, than what we could do with the other methods. So when we do an empirical order, we're gonna to wanna to give the lab Ks, Rx, and often the corneal diameter. And, and again, this is inexpensive because there's no investment on my part for diagnostic lenses or necessarily even new equipment, but I do have to wait for my first set of lenses to come in. Now, these are gonna be probably the least likely lenses to work on the first try because we're making a lot of assumptions about the cornea, um, about its shape. And so just off of the three data points of central K readings and the corneal diameter, we're trying to come up with a lens that fits ideally, and that's just not gonna be successful most of the time. Um, some studies show that you can get first lens success using an empirical method, maybe 70 to 80% of the time. But again, I, that's not fitting a lot of patients that are on the challenging side. Using a fitting set, again, can sometimes be more successful, mainly because if you put a lens on and it's not ideal, you hopefully have another lens in your set right away to compare to and try to find a better fitting lens. Um, again, the problem with this is that um, it's only gonna work if the optimal lens is actually in your fitting set or in your diagnostic set. Um, we've been working on uh, uh, looking at our patients, uh, studying what percentage of patients should have toric ortho K lenses. We looked at about 100 eyes from six to 16 year old kids. And um, we found that 45% of the children in that we've evaluated their corneal topography had the need for a toric uh, lens to optimally fit their eye. And most of our fitting sets and diagnostic sets do not come with toric lens designs. So again, you're, you're really only gonna be optimally fitting maybe uh, 50 to 60% of your patients out of that fitting set. And again, this does require an investment in a fitting set if you wanna use this method. So the final way of, of potentially doing ortho K fitting is using software design lenses. And again, this is gonna use thousands of data points from your corneal topography, not just your three points of your central K readings. It's going to come up with ideal fit parameters based upon knowing the eccentricity in each meridian. It's going to um, have a lot more chance for success because it's gonna tell you whether you need a toric lens, for example, um, or even if you have a quadrant specific cornea where you, you might find that the eccentricity is different in each quadrant, you can sometimes optimize for that as well. It does require waiting for your first lens and it may require investment in equipment and or software, but it's going to provide the most optimal fit um, with least chance of having to remake. The true benefits of doing a software design ortho K lens are to get the best possible fit the first time. And this is gonna save you in chair time, follow-ups, exchanges. It just makes it a much more efficient process for your office. You're going to get better outcomes on more complicated patients because you have their full corneal information and you're making a lens to fit their individual and unique corneal shape. You can take on more challenging prescriptions, higher RXs, corneal astigmatism, et cetera, uh, more challenging corneal shapes. 
And again, you have the option with these software designs to play around with some of the parameters of the lens that you can't necessarily do with most um, fitting set designs or empirically ordered lenses. And what do I mean by that? Um, you can adjust the optic zone on a lens design for a child who's in myopia management. Maybe you want a smaller optic zone to keep the area of um, the red ring of plus closer to their visual axis. You can do that with a software design lens. Maybe you want to have a larger optic zone. Sometimes we still do ortho K on adults, and maybe I've got a patient who's an adult and I want to open up the optic zone to try to reduce their night vision issues. I can do that with a software design lens. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do with a software design that we can't necessarily do very easily with the other design options that we have. Um, and just to, to kind of look at this, we've been doing a little bit of retrospective look at uh, a number of patients. So we looked at the patients within um, 2019 that we had fitted within about an eight month period, we fitted 27 patients using software based lens designs. Um, this isn't all of the patients that we fitted, but these were just the ones that we use software designs for. We fitted 27 patients. We found that 23 of those patients, we were one and done. The first pair of lenses worked for them with no exchanges or remakes needed. The other four patients we got within one remake. So we were successful with all 27 patients with an average of 1.3 lenses per eye. That's pretty good uh, odds, pretty good numbers. Our average prescription in this patient base was about a minus 325. So it did take into account some lower prescriptions, some higher prescriptions, um, everything within the approved range. So tonight I just want to run through three different software integrations that are available on Keratograph and Pentacam for OrthoK lens design. And these are not, um, this is not part of Oculus. This is something that we're going to talk about um, because it's important to realize that Oculus instrumentation sees the value in these programs and allows you to, with your devices, have this powerful tool um, in your practice. So we're going to talk about the Arise lens, the new um, Bausch design that's just launching now, um, as well as iSpace and Wave. So the Arise lens design, um, I'm just going to walk you through literally how this instrument work or how this program works and how you would create a lens design using this software. So here's our topography we've taken. Um, this is my daughter and so she has allowed me to share her maps with y'all. Um, she is an ortho K lens wearer like all my kids are. Um, so after we've got our, our maps taken, we look at a few things on our, on our topography that are helpful bits of information. Again, we're looking at our co total corneal coverage. With this map, it's 76%, so this is an acceptable amount of corneal coverage on my map. We also see that our sag height difference is 22 microns, so again, we should be able to fit her in a lens which is not toric, just a simple spherical basic lens should work. One other point here is our corneal diameter is worth noting at 11.33. That's important information which sometimes our software programs will ask us to pull in for us or to verify. So it's something I like to take a look at prior to launching into my software program. If you look at the very top in the blue box, there's a box on my instrument called external software. And when I click on that, it drops down a list of all of the software programs that are integrated with my instrument. So for my instrument, I've got, again, um, the Arise, the iSpace, and the Wave software all linked to my instrument. So I can choose to create a lens with any of those designs anytime I want to using my instrument. So in this case, we're going to create an Arise uh, OrthoK lens. When I choose the external software, this box pops up. It is uploading the patient's data to the cloud-based software. And we're going to get done, and we're going to click on the blue link to launch the software. When we do that, we bring up this um, software program. The instrument, or the, the software program, sorry, will import the topography to the patient's um, database. And so now we've got right eye, left eye, we can see the topographies for this patient, and we can then enter their uh, information into the system, their refractive information. 
So we're going to work on designing a right lens first. This is the screen that we're going to sh we're going to see. Um, we've got on the left the current design parameters, and so this is the default information that pops up once we enter the patient's refractive error. Um, again, you can see that some of this information isn't exactly correct. It's going to require us to edit that information. Uh, for example, it's saying our HVEID is 11.8. Well, we know it's not 11.8, so that needs to be changed. Um, we also see a lens um, diameter, which has been chosen for us, which we may want to edit, and a lens power, which indicates our Jessen factor, which we may want to adjust as well. One other thing of note with the Arise, you have four different optic zone size options. And so when we click that, you see the drop-down box that's highlighted now. We have the option of a 5.0 optic zone, a 5.5, a 6.0, or a 6.6. And again, generally speaking, we're gonna, I like to pick the 5.5 optic zone for kids. And for adults, I'll either use a 6.0 if they have a higher prescription, or if they have a lower prescription adult, I like to use the 6.6 optic zone. Again, it gives us a little bit larger treatment area. And for those patients where myopia control really isn't a priority, it's a nice option, especially again, if the prescription's low enough to get a good outcome with a larger treatment zone. In the box over on the right, it's gonna show us more information. It's gonna give us, again, that SAG differential we measured. It's gonna give us a recommended lens geometry again. It's recommending a symmetric or rotational or basically spherical lens design as opposed to a toric. And it's also recommending a back optic zone diameter of 5.5 because it knows that this is a child. Here are, again, her topographies. You can see in the upper left, we've got a sag height differential of 22 in our box, um, as opposed to another patient where we see a higher value, a sag height differential of 29. Um, this is on the display on our keratograph. And again, the patient on the bottom box at 29, actually, it recommended that we do a toric design. So this is important information, again, to get optimal fits for our patients. So we go back to our software and um, we're going to enter in the box some of our information. Um, what we can see then on the top left is the information that we've entered. We have a refractive error of minus 175 in the sphere power. Um, it naturally defaults to a Jessen factor of a half diopter. Again, the Jessen factor, of course, is the amount we're going to correct beyond the patient's refractive error. So a target of 175 yields us a lens um, of two and a quarter. I like to go a little bit more than that. So I added an extra quarter diopter of prescription. Um, I changed her HVID to 11.4, um, and then I changed her lens diameter to 10.6. I like to fit between a half and one millimeter smaller than the patient's corneal diameter. So in this case, we picked about eight tenths of a millimeter smaller. Going down below, you see in the box, after we have fitted the patient with the lens and dispensed them, if there is any issue with the lens fit, um, we're going to record our results and the overnight lens position. Um, as you can see from the drop down, it's telling us to enter, is the topography at follow up a bullseye pattern or do we have a problem like a central island, a smiley face, frowny face or lateral decentration? If we do, the software will then help us to correct and modify our fit to get a better outcome. So for example, if we're not sure just to what extent a problem we have, but we think we have a frowny face topography, we can click on our overnight outcome map. It shows us examples of a mild frowny face, a moderate or severe. We then click the one that we think is most accurate to the topography we're looking at. And again, the instrument then helps us to modify our fit to get a better outcome. And so again, in our overnight results box, we may have a, for example, a smiley face. We check the severity of that. And then we may also see residual spectacle RX. Do we have lens binding? Do we have a small treatment zone, et cetera? So we would check all of these, and then if necessary, it's going to remake our lens for us, adjusting for the problems that we've got that are keeping our, our um, patient from getting an optimal outcome. 
So that's the Arise software again, uh, a lot of benefits to it. It's very simple to use. It's very user friendly for the patient who doesn't want, or for the practitioner who doesn't want to spend hours and hours getting familiar with how to use a software program. It can be very effective. Um, it does automatically, again, prescribe tericity. It does allow you to adjust the patient's optic zone for age and for visual demands, et cetera. So it's a very, um, user-friendly, and it can be a very effective software to help design OrthoK lenses. Now, I'm going to move on to the Wave software and talk about that next. Um, we're going to go through a, a case example of a patient that was fitted in the Wave design, just so you can see, again, how that software program works. Here's our corneal topography done, this time on a Pentacam. And the important note here, again, is the patient's horizontal white-to-white 12.3 millimeters. That's important information as we move through prescribing. Here's our starting point with our WAVE software. We open up our external software box. We choose the WAVE software. The lens, um, the software design program opens up and immediately designs us a basic um, spherical RGP lens. But we don't want that. We want an ortho K design. So we're going to go ahead and choose our toolbox down below. And it's going to open up our configuration settings. And this is a place where we are going to decide what type of lens we want to fit. So in this case, as you see in the upper right, we're going to choose an ortho K design. And then we're going to look at some of our default settings. Do we want a 6.0 optic zone, for example? If you look at the second arrow, do we want an apical clearance of four microns? Going further down, do we want a center thickness of 0.25, a target lens power of plus 175, which again is your Jessen factor, and an overall diameter of 11. If there's any of these factors that you want to change for this given patient, you can do it at this point, and it will create the lens for you in an ortho -K design with the specifics that you have entered in your configuration setting. Now, in this case, for this patient, I know the patient's prescription is minus four and a quarter, which is still reasonable for ortho K, but I wanted to bring the optic zone down just a sliver to 5.9. Um, I also think that 175 was a bit aggressive for a Jessen factor, so I brought the target lens power down to plus one, as you see. I also know that this patient's uh, white to white was 12.3. And so for my personal preference, I wanted to change the overall diameter of the lens to 11.5, which gets me into that somewhere around three quarters of a millimeter smaller than the HVID. So this is my settings I wanted. I now hit continue and I've got my lens design in front of me. Um, so at this point now I have the opportunity to look at a couple different options for how to best optimize this patient's contact lens. First of all, as you um, saw before, um, we have a different, three different options for the type of lens we want to use. If you look at the red star down at the middle right side of the screen, you see a R box, a G box, and a F box. Um, those boxes allow you to choose what type of lens you want, whether it be spherical, um, toric, or freeform. In this case, you can see if we choose R or a spherical lens, if you look at the simulated fluorescein pattern above, you see we don't have a very strong alignment zone. So in this case, probably fitting a spherical lens is not ideal. In this case, we move to a geometrically symmetric lens or a toric lens. We see a much more solid ring of alignment all the way around. Certainly looks like a much better fit. If we look at our tier layer clearances on our picture on the upper left, you can see that we're getting much closer to alignment where our two red stars are. And then if we move to a completely free form design, you can see now an excellent uh, fluorescein pattern. You can see again, the two red stars show almost perfect alignment through the alignment zone for this lens. And this would give us obviously the best possible fit. Um, finally, as we look at our options and we, and we go ahead and um, choose the freeform design, um, I look at my lens thickness of 0.25 and I decide I want to make it a little bit thinner. So I have the option of clicking on the box where the red star is located and changing my center thickness to 0.22. And just like that, I've created a um, customized lens made for that patient's eye, the right diameter, the right base curve,
the right fit through the alignment zone, and I'm going to trust that I'm going to get a solid ring of 360 degrees of centration, of alignment, and the best possible fit for my patient. So the final case I want to walk through is iSpace. Um, and here again, we're going to talk through the software real briefly. Um, we've up uploaded a map again to our software program. Um, if we look in our Caretograph or Wave software, external software, um, we're going to be able to import these topographies as you can see. We're going to then choose in the new lens design area, the Forge Ortho K lens. We're going to enter the patient's HVID, which we measured to be 12.3. And then we're going to enter the patient's spectacle RX. In this case, we've got a patient with a higher prescription, more astigmatism than the patient we just fitted. And this is our lens design page then that we that pops up with our initial design. It gives us a lot of information here to look at. Um, you can see our simulated fluorescein pattern at the lower right. It's showing that we have 27 microns of central clearance. If we look at some of our other bits of information, uh, the star, red star starting at the top, we've got our flat K, steep K, and delta K. Um, we also see a, a change in sag at nine millimeters of 86, so certainly this patient needs a toric lens at least. Um, we also see the patient's HVID of 12.3 recorded and their spectacle RX. Again, as we move further down, you see the red star indicating the toric option. Um, the software decided that the toric lens was the best way to go for this patient. It then gives us the back optic zone radius, the Z zone, which is your return zone measurement, your alignment curve, which is your um, alignment zone in um, millimeters of curvature, and then a lens diameter as well. We also have the option, looking down below, to alter the back optic zone and the width of the return zone as well if we want to. So all of these numbers that you see in these boxes are adjustable. You simply click on the box and alter the number in the box. So for this individual patient, um, I wanted to change the back optic zone radius because again, I felt like the um, Jessen factor was a little bit aggressive for this patient. Um, so we change it from a 10.3 to a 10.1 base curve. We also adjusted the diameter, again, keeping in mind that the patient's HVID was 12.3. I wanted an 11.5, so I changed that. And then again, I also changed the base, uh, the optic zone diameter from 6.0 down to 5.8 because this prescription's kind of high, and I felt like we had a better chance to get full correction if we decrease the optic zone slightly. Um, we then redraw the lens, and you can see that we've now got a lot more central clearance because we've changed some parameters. And we'll need to click the button that says Optimize A, C, and Z zone, and it will redraw the lens for us, optimizing the return zone and alignment curves. And this is the lens that we end up at this point. Now, we look at this fit, and it's not a bad fit. Um, I do see some bearing indicated by the blue zone up above. And so I decide I want to adjust the Z zone slightly because 17 microns of clearance for me is a little bit much. So I'm going to decrease my Z zone slightly. And I'm also going to change the alignment curve and make it just a little bit flatter. So we redraw and we get a better outcome. Now, briefly, I want to go through again, same example as we had with the wave. We have the option here of choosing a rotationally symmetric lens, as you see, or a spherical design, which is marked by the red star. For this patient, it creates a lens which looks like it is, there is tericity, and there is. This is not an ideal fitting lens. This is an example of we need a toric um, alignment curve. We can also consider a quadrant specific lens in this case. Here, if we choose the quad box, which you see again marked with the red star, um, you can see the four uh, quadrants of the lens, the optic zone radius, the Z zone depth, and the alignment curve in each of the four quadrants. We do again have the option of changing any of these zones to improve the fit. And so again, just wanting to tinker with it a little bit, I want to try to get rid of this area of blue, which indicates the lens bearing. And so by adjusting these parameters um, and adjusting the alignment curve particularly, kind of cleaned up the fit a little bit and got to what I feel is a good fitting lens. We also wanted to tweak the Z zone and get my 
uh, central clearance down below 10 microns, which is where I'd like it to be between five and 10. And so by adjusting in all the different parameters using a quad zone, we were able to go ahead and get an optimal fit for this patient. So again, this is a little bit of complicated uh, procedure, but it's, it's actually something where as you get more familiar with the software, you can just tinker and play and create some really sophisticated, optimally fitting lenses. It's a lot of fun to be able to create this for our patients. So I just had one bonus case I wanted to mention here, and this is just a lot of fun. I've got some pictures that go with it. This was a patient who um, is actually a student here at the school. She's got a relatively high prescription, minus six-ish with three diopters of astigmatism, as you can see by the maps. And again, we've got a, a horizontal white-to-white -white of 12.2. So we went ahead and created some lenses for her. Now, again, because of her higher prescription, she's outside of approved parameters. So this is an off-label use. But the things that we chose were, I wanted to decrease the optic zone again down to 5.8, because I thought that that would give us a better chance of getting full correction. Um, we adjusted the target lens power again down to 125 and um, adjusted the overall lens diameter to be a better fit for her eye at around 11.4. So we went ahead and created our lens design. And again, here's an example you can see in the upper right picture, the fluorescein pattern. When we did a spherical design, you can see this is a poor alignment curve. If we would fit this patient in a standard ortho -K lens without a toric design, we would not end up with a good fit by any means. By moving to a geometrically symmetric lens, again, we make a big improvement in our lens fit. We see the alignment is, is much better than it was in a rotational lens. Moving to a free form, we end up with, again, a very similar fit, um, good alignment, 360. Um, we're, we feel good about being able to align this high prescription on this patient's eye. And this is actually the lens design that we were able to make with our software. Um, again, you can see that this doesn't look like a patient with nearly three diopters of corneal astigmatism. This lens has very nice symmetric uh, alignment all the way around 360 degrees. It's a very well-centered lens. The diameter of the lens is optimal for this patient's cornea, and we are able to get um, a really nice fitting lens using our uh, software-based design. And here's just a video of that lens on eye. You do see a small bubble. This was there just shortly after placement. Again, for a patient with, um, in that vertical meridian, with essentially almost seven and a half, eight diopters of myopia, I'm not surprised to get a little bit of an of a initial air bubble upon placement of that lens. Again, making the optic zone smaller in this case at 5.8 probably helped. If we had a larger optic zone, we probably would have had a larger air bubble. So um, there are other lenses, again, that integrate with the um, software or with the instruments that I didn't mention tonight, just for time. Um, and again, don't forget, you have the option of doing integrations with scleral designs as well, where you can make some pretty sophisticated freeform designs. Some of these software programs are free to you as users, and some of them are come at it with an annual subscription cost. So again, the modern contact lens practice, um, using instrumentation like the Pentacam, um, with getting full corneal coverage, um, getting to look for any signs of irregular cornea health, getting to create both ortho -K and scleral lens designs, um, using software integration that are very sophisticated, very high tech, very optimized fits, um, all in your practice right now with this instrument. The Keratograph as well, with all its other great features like the dry eye um, diagnostic section, the, the photography, um, but as well, the ability to create ortho -K design lenses that are optimized for our patient's fit and follow them through the fitting process um, to a successful outcome. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for your attention, for your time tonight. Um, hopefully this uh, short webinar gave you the opportunity to see that the instrumentation the Pentacam and the Keratograph are powerful, and there are software uh, programs that are available with both of these instruments that can um, help you to really take on pretty much any patient in terms of ortho -K fits, in terms of lens design, creating some optimal fits and not settling for 
um, just a, a, a reasonable fit or a, a situation where the patient's not complaining, but it doesn't look great, um, you can really target and create optimal fits for all of your ortho K patients. Michelle, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedlicka. Just okay. a reminder on your GoToWebinar screen, there is a text box where you can enter any questions you may have. If you missed part of the webinar or if there's anything you would like to go back and review, you will receive a link to the recording in the next week. All right, we do have some questions that have been submitted. And one of those questions was, what should I be looking for in a device for a pediatric practice? <clears throat> Yeah, great. So, you know, that's a good question, and uh, we kind of addressed it at the beginning. Um, if you're looking for the ability to do corneal topography on kids, um, so I'll go back to um, 10 years ago. I was you, I was working with a different corneal topographer in my practice, and it was a, a small, uh, small cone, small a head cone, and I struggled a lot with my children to get good maps because I needed to get in so tight and they they um, would be tentative. They'd pull away and, and it was difficult. So about 10 years ago when I was looking at getting a new corneal topographer, one of the priorities I had was I wanted it to be user friendly for my, for my technicians, but also want it to be friendly for my patients. And um, the care to graph is great because again, no intimidation factor. The patients are sitting, you know, several, a few inches away at least from the bowl. Um, you don't have to have the bright rings of light on. You can have the infrared on, so it looks just all you see is the is the target. Um, so again, I, I I loved having the keratograph transitioning from a small head to a large head topographer um, in in doing a lot of kids um, was really a, a huge benefit. And and then so I would suggest again thinking about what makes a child. Um, comfortable or uncomfortable, and and I felt like the the small head topographer really was something that the kids kind of pulled away from, or or made them a little bit nervous, or made it more difficult for me to get really good maps. Thank you. And uh, kind of along that same lines, when you are working with young young ages and ortho K fitting, when you're working with the Oculus device, uh, if you have any kits that are very fidgety, uh, do you have any recommendations for how to help them stay still or anything along those lines? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that's always something with kids, you know, they're, they it's sometimes getting them to, to be still. Um, again, I think that having the, the ring light off as you're uh, getting things set up helps because it makes them more comfortable. Um, it's just really a matter of reminding them to try their best to be still. Um, we can often have a technician kind of stand there with a the child and help stabilize them. Um, sometimes we'll ask the kids. So if you've ever looked at <clears throat> the um, headrest for the keratograph, it's got a significant, um, you know, pole or, or a, a a stand on either side of the of the headrest, and so sometimes we'll have the kids hold on to those um, as we're doing it uh, because that will help them to be stable as well. Um, adjusting the height of the table and chair so that the patient or the child doesn't have to stretch or reach, um, that they can be very comfortable. Yeah, you know, I think just accommodating their their needs and, and optimizing the environment around them, reminding them that they need to hold really still just for a second. And again, because the, the keratograph is so quick, once you get lined up, um, it, it takes an image so quickly, um, you can take multiple images and just keep taking them um, until you get the best one. All right. So, you, there's many options of different external softwares that collaborate with uh, different Oculus devices, and you listed many of those. Uh, what situations would make you choose to use a, one specific external software? Do you have certain parameters that you you look for when you choose a certain software over the other? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, it's going to come down to a couple things. One, maybe you have a lab you like to work with. Um, two, uh, how sophisticated is the lens you need to make? Um, personally, I have um, I use all the different types of software, and it kind of depends. Again, 
Um, if I want to move to a scleral lens design, for example, obviously I'm going to use one of the scleral applications like Wave. If I want to do an ortho-K lens, it's going to come down to a couple of things. One is going to be the cost. One is going to be exchange and return policies. Um, and the other one, again, is going to be how sophisticated a lens do I need. So as I sit and look at my, um, my patient's topography, and you can tell, again, by the uh, amount of difference in the... Um, in the sag height differential maps, you can often look at your topography and see whether you look like you've got a fairly symmetric cornea or do I have one sector that's more asymmetric. Um, you definitely see corneas that have a higher nasal cornea, for example, than a temporal cornea. And sometimes that will cause a lens to decenter laterally much more easily. Um, sometimes higher prescriptions. Again, so I think some of the software programs are more powerful like I think Wave is extremely powerful and you can fit pretty much any patient in it, um, but sometimes it can be a little bit more daunting to manipulate all of the parameters. So uh, I think I think they're all good. I think that uh, depending upon what type of patients you're gonna be fitting and how, how into it you want to get, um, you can choose which software program works best for you. Thank you. How do you get the widest images of the cornea? Do you manually uh, lift the lids, have them turn their nose uh, from the center of the dome? Uh, what are some of your recommendations? Sure. I mean, we we obviously, I'm not a, when it comes to either the keratograph or Pentacam, um, getting enough data, if the patient just opens their eyes as wide as they can or reasonably wide, that's sufficient. Now, the one case will be, again, like you mentioned, sometimes you lose a little bit of nasal data because of the shadowing of the nose. In that case, yes, turning the head, you know, slightly five or 10 degrees to the side, having the patient look back into the instrument. Usually you can pick up better nasal data in that case. Um, getting good temporal and inferior data is rarely a problem. It's, again, mainly nasal and superior. So usually just reminding the patient open wide, um, you can get the superior aspect, especially as you're as you're preparing to capture the image and you're getting it closer into focus and you can tell you're almost there, you know, remind the patient right about that point, take a blink and open wide and, and hopefully the moment they open wide, you're right there and it fires and takes your picture. So again, I think um, I, with, the, with either of these instruments, if I'm just obtaining corneal maps, we don't usually hold lids. Now, if, if we're using the Pentacam and obtaining scleral data, because we have the scleral software as well, then of course you have to hold lids. But just for corneal data, you shouldn't need to hold lids. And sometimes you might need to turn ahead, absolutely. Thank you. If you have a dry eye patient, do you use artificial tears to prove the quality of the tear film given that placido topographers are tear film dependent? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think that if you anticipate, it's, it's best if you anticipate that you're going to need it before you get to the instrument, if that's possible. So for example, um, if I have a patient, and I'm not talking necessarily about just ortho okay, but if I know I need a corneal topography on any patient, and I suspect that there's going to be some issues with tear quality, I'd love, love to put the tear drop in a good minute or two before I take my map, because I don't want to have excessive tears either, and it's going to create a tear meniscus inferiorly that will throw off my data. Um, however, if you're if you're in the process of trying to capture an image and you've got bad data because of dry eye and you have no choice, then yes, absolutely using an artificial tear. Um, you may just have to wait a minute or two for the patient to blink a bit for some of that tear to dissipate before you're able to capture an image. Do you take into account pupil size diameter measured with the Pentacam in Ortho-K lens design? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, I will honestly say that I don't often think about pupil size, and that's not because it's not important. Again, I think when we're talking about children and we're talking about ortho K for myopia management, the consensus is we'd like to keep the optic zone small anyway, regardless of their pupil size. Um, as we move into adults, my preference is to keep the optic zone as large as I can, 
prescription permitting. And of course, that means that, for example, I have a patient who I recently fitted who's 50 years old, and we just fitted one eye for monovision. She's a minus one. Um, you know, in her case, of course, I'm going to open up the optic zone to 6.6, 6.8 millimeters because I can, because it's a distance eye, because it's a low prescription, because it's an adult. Um, if that same, if I had a 50 year old who was a minus six, um, I'm not going to achieve the best correction if I have got a 6.6 .6 millimeter optic zone. It's going to have to come down to again, six millimeters, even 5.8 necessarily, 5.6 maybe. So, I mean, your, your choice of optic zone in children is probably going to be dependent upon what you're trying to achieve with myopia management. Your choice of optic zone in adults, from my perspective at least, is to be as large as I can while still managing a successful refractive outcome. And, and so that the prescription will be a bigger dictating factor to me than the pupil size. What do you find is your best way of getting new ortho K pa patients if you're starting from scratch and don't have a current patient base? Uh, what What do you recommend doing? Sure. Well, if if you're talking about children, I mean, I would think that most practitioners have myopic children in their practice now. So you certainly have a patient base already. You just aren't fitting them in ortho K lenses. Um, making the decision that um, in your own mind that myopia uh, or um, axial length growth is, is not a good thing. Um, if you truly believe that there are ocular health risks with age that are associated with increased axial length and that you'd like to prevent that as much as possible, then you then you are straight up with patients and you talk about myopia management. And, um, you know, I, I firmly believe in it. I, like I said, I've got two myopic children and a myopic wife and they all do ortho K. That's what we do. And and my kids' prescription has barely changed in the years they have been in ortho K where they were changing a diopter a year before that. So it clearly I think it works. I think if you if you dive into ortho K and you do it and you offer it to patients, I think it helps to fit staff or family or somebody in it first so you can get some positive feedback. And then once you see how it works, once you believe that it's a good thing, um, it becomes a lot more easy to talk to patients about it and explain the benefits. Uh, again, fr from my perspective, if I have a, a seven-year-old child who's a minus three, um, and my options are to send them to school with eyeglasses that will probably get broken, or with, heaven forbid, hydrogel soft lenses like the, the myopia management soft lenses are now, or do ortho K where they wear hyper DK lenses eight hours a night at bedtime and mom and dad are there to help put their lenses on and take them off and manage the cleaning process. I mean, which one sounds the best to me? I would prefer to do ortho K. So I think if you really sincerely think about the different options for correcting a child's vision um, and then, you know, become convinced that this really is a good way to do it and you know, the price of daily disposable soft lenses isn't inexpensive and replacing eyeglasses once or twice a year isn't inexpensive. So it's not a it's not a price thing. And it, and it certainly, again, makes a lot more sense to me to send a child off out out to school or out to, to play with their friends or go to the swimming pool or whatever without corrective lenses than to have them wearing soft lenses or glasses um, in those circumstances. So I think I think it's just convincing yourself that this is actually a really good thing and a really good way to do it, and then talk to people about it, mention it. I think the more you talk about it, the people people just accept it. And again, I I have seen a real um, excitement level about myopia management in the last six to twelve months with the FDA's approval of a device for myopia management, and it extends to all types of myopia management now. Our, our pediatric clinic is just referring people regularly now for myopia managing contact lenses. So it's just, it's just about believing it and then talking about it. 
Great. I believe we have time for one more question, and this is kind of along the lines of what is your follow-up regimen with fitting either fitting new patients, but also with patients that are happy with their contact lenses? What are uh, what is your follow-up for those patients, and do you ever proactively redesign their lenses? Okay, sure. So. Um... Part one is going through the fitting process. Ideally, we like to dispense the lenses and see them back day one. Um, if everything looks reasonable, I like to see them back one week. If everything looks reasonable, I like to see them back at one month. And then at that point, if everything looks great, three months, and then one final checkup at six months before they get back into their annual exam after that. So that's the plan. And um, I will say that back, you know, some years ago when I was working with lens designs that weren't as good as what I am now, sometimes we were seeing patients a lot in those six months because we were exchanging lenses and exchanging lenses. And every time you do that, you have to see them back sooner. Um, we've got to the point now where I'm, I'm doing this one and done or maybe one and one remake and the, the follow-ups are a lot more infrequent. Once we get past the first year, um, Depending upon the patient, some patients, I see them every six months because we're concerned about their progression of myopia, et cetera, um, or they're a higher prescription, or they may be a little bit more at risk for issues. Um, and some patients I just see annually after that, and, and they do really well with that. And of course, we always make sure the patients are aware that um, if they ever have any unusual visual issues or symptoms that they just need to call. They don't need to, they don't want to be afraid to call and talk to somebody and see if we need to evaluate them. We don't ever want to take a chance with their child's vision. Um, so, you know, we do see people more often on an as needed basis, but as far as scheduled follow-ups, um, that would be the strategy. And can you repeat part two of that, Michelle? Part two of that question was, do you ever proactively redesign oh, their could. lenses? Yeah, I do actually. And again, so this is where um, having a good baseline map really comes in handy. But I would say that in the last year, I've probably taken, you know, 10 to 12 patients that were coming in for their regular checkups and were semi okay with things. Maybe they were 2025, 20, you know, minus a letter or two, which isn't bad, but wasn't perfect. And I look at their map and it's, you know, their treatment's a little bit decentered with a little bit of astigmatism. And again, five or 10 years ago, I would have said, hey, this is great. You know, get out of here. See you next year. Um, however, n since I've been using more and more of these software based lens designs, if I can go back to their original topography and know the base curve that I need because I can know where they're at right now with their current lens. Um, I've redesigned them lenses and it's been great. Um, I don't wash the patients even out of their old lenses. When the new one comes in, we just move them to their new lens and off they go. And I've had success every time doing a redesign using a software-based lens. It's been an improvement for those patients who were kind of iffy coming in. Um, I wouldn't do it on everybody if they had a great outcome, but certainly on those patients who are kind of borderline outcomes, if you have a good baseline, you can certainly go back and, and refit people. All right, thank you, Dr. Jedlika, for that great presentation. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for everyone who sent in questions and thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Dr. Jedlika. You're welcome. All right, this concludes the presentation and on behalf of Oculus, good night, everyone.